Thank you, Alberto. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank the Lassus Department for um, this invitation and for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'm quite excited to be back in Madison. Um, I finished my master's in 2007 and haven't been back since. And I don't know if a lot of things have changed in Madison. I feel I have changed quite a bit. So it's, it's really nice to be back. Um, after I finished my uh, degree here in Madison, I worked for the International Organization for Migration in Uruguay and Germany for two years and for a German political foundation in South Africa for another year. And then I started my studies at the LSE in London last October. What I'm going to share with you today is the empirical background of my dissertation project, which are South-South movements to Latin America. And in today's presentation and my current research, I focus on African flows for two reasons. These are that African migration to Latin America is the more recent phenomena than most Asian flows to the region. And second of all, um, it has shown steeper increases in recent years. It's a very new phenomenon I'm talking about. So the challenge with that is that basically no literature or very few studies exist to describe or let alone explain it. Again, what I'm presenting is exploratory research. Um, I, I, passed, or, um, I was in Ecuador for five weeks in July and August and um, interviewed over 90 politicians, um, NGO workers and migrants. However, I wasn't able yet to, to process all those interviews, but just to give you a background that that is what I've done. I wrote a report for the International Organization for Migration, which is very interested in this topic too. And um, yeah, again, I'm looking forward to, to your feedback and perhaps ideas on how to improve the ways I'm approaching and thinking about these issues. I will talk about um, five points today. I will first of all explain why I think that the study of African migration to Latin America matters. I will present what we know about these flows um, based on the existing empirical data. I will explore possible theoretical answers to the question why Africans increasingly move to Latin America. And here we'll give two examples of the most prominent African groups in Argentina and Nigeria. I will then also talk a little bit about the policy reactions of Latin American governments to these new inflows. And finally, present some ideas of the kind of research agenda we should maybe develop based on this empirical background. As I'm doing my PhD in political science at the LSE, it's perhaps a little surprising that my main argument is that policy matters, that the liberalization of Latin American policy in the field of migration in Latin, in Latin America ha ha has an impact and has had an impact on these new flows. So why, why do I think that African or studying African migration to Latin America matters? 
Outside of Africa, the public perception of African migration is commonly characterized by the image of waves of desperate people fleeing poverty and warfare and crossing the Mediterranean in precarious conditions in hope of reaching an elusive European El Dorado. It is true that most African migrants outside of Africa live in Europe. However, I think it is often forgotten that the majority of African migrants move within the coastal borders of their own continent. Any extracontinental journey requires relatively high levels of human and financial resources. Thus, the Africans who decide to leave Africa are not the poorest of the poor. Even though it may seem counterintuitive in the light of the perception of the desperate poor Africans, I believe that potential African migrants exercise agency in choosing their destinations and their migratory routes. Both academic studies and the public discourse on international migration are characterized by a certain general south-north bias. This bias suggests that, constant, that there are constant global flows of people from the underdeveloped global south to the developed north. Such flows include both Latin, America to, to the, Latin Americans to the United States and African migration to Europe. But south-north movements have not, and most probably will not always be the dominant form of international migration. Migratory systems are not inherently stable, and the status of sending and receiving countries does change. If we think about Europe and Latin America, that's a very good example of such a migration transition in the 20th century, because Latin America, from, from the beginning of the first arrivals of Europeans after 1500 until the mid um, 20th century, was a region of net immigration, and in the case of the turn from the 90s to the 20th century, a region of mass European immigration. And Europe made the re reverse transition and became a region of immigration or net immigration by the 1990s. So I believe that overemphasizing over south-north migration inaccurately reflects global patterns of human mobility. According to the International Organization for Migration, the share of international migrants living in developed or high-income countries decreased from 63% in 2000, in 2000 to 57% in, in 2010. So 43% or other studies say almost half of all migrants in the world move from south to south origins and destinations. Furthermore, a recent OECD working paper um, proves or tries to prove that most destination countries receive mainly migrants that, that come from the same region. And this paper says that in the case of Africa, 85% of all migrants come from other African countries and that this percentage reaches 75% in Asia and 62% in Latin America. So south-south migration certainly matters and we, sh we should try to understand the specific dynamics of these flows within and across continents. In this context of the south-north bias, Latin America has been generally classified as a country of emigration in past decades. It is true that from 2000 to 2010, emigration flows, so all the people that left Latin America, surpassed immigration flows, the people who came to Latin America, by 11 million people. However, if we take 2010 as an example, there were 7.5 million migrants within the region. So I think it is, it is dangerous to, to classify the region exclusively as a, as a region of emigration because that will lead us to, to ignore the substantial movements that are hidden underneath those net differences. <clears throat> Significant differences also exist in the aggregated distribution of migrants within the region. And it seems that regional patterns are shifting. Um, whereas traditional receiving countries such as Argentina and Venezuela experienced a decrease of their immigration population in recent years, Mexico, for example, has experienced significant increases of immigrants. Contemporary extracontinental migration from Asia and Africa is a new phenomenon. I want to point out from the beginning that obviously compared to both the flows of Africans towards Europe and, and the US, and compared to regional flows from neighboring countries within the region, these flows are extremely small. And some people might say, they don't matter, why are you studying them? But I think if we're interested in, in looking at the, the context, the, the conditions that facilitate the emergence of new migratory flows, the existing upward trend is extremely interesting and definitely worth studying. So to conclude this first part, um, I think that as academics, we have to be sensitive to the fluctuant nature of mig migratory flows from a historic macro perspective. And we have to try to investigate which circumstances trigger changes in the direction and makeup of migration flows. 
Studying African migration to Latin America offers us the unique opportunity to better understand both cross-continental South-South migration, to test existing migration theory, and to identify the specific conditions that facilitate the formation of new migratory flows. Furthermore, as an additional point, looking at the government reactions of Latin American governments to these flows also allows us to study the determinants of immigration policy making within the Latin American context. So what do we know about African flows to Latin America? Um, there has been increasing and heightened an interest of the, region, of the region's governments in this phenomena. Um, not only because the IOM um, asked me to do the study and, and asked other um, researchers to do studies in different countries in Latin America, but also because they, for example, organized the, sorry, the Organization of American States, the OIS, organized a conference in 2010 um, where basically the idea was to discuss and share first experiences with this new extracontinental, extracontinental immigration. And since this conference in 2010, various studies by organiza organizations such as the International Organization for, the, um, organi for Migration have been commissioned. So the representatives of um, national migration departments of seven Latin American countries, as well as the International Organization for Migration and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees came together in this conference and um, discuss what they described as the new and growing phenomena of Asian and African migration. They also pointed out that these flows are made up by mixed migratory flows. They identified the major African countries of origin as, let's see if this works, Senegal, Nigeria, and in the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia. And the main countries of destination in Latin America is Argentina, uh, Ecuador and Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala, and Mexico. And um, what, seems to, what seems to be the case, what, um, as, as the conference reports describe, is that we see two different kinds of flows. We see one flow from the Horn of Africa, mainly to Ecuador, Colombia, and Central America, with the intention of migrants to then transmigrate up, the, up to the United States, and a second flow, which is perhaps even more interesting, of Senegalese and Nigerians who migrate to Argentina with the intention of staying in the region. Um, again, when I, when I first read this conference report, when I, when I read about the fact that governments were concerned about this issue, I couldn't help but wonder why. Because when you, when you compare the, the inflows of Africans to regional flows, they're minuscule. I would like to give you a few examples. The approximately 400 African asylum applications Colombia and Ecuador received together in 2009 compared to over 30,000 Colombians who filed asylum claims in Ecuador in the same year. Costa Rica detained less than 100 and Mexico less than 800 African irregular immigrants in 2009, while Costa Rica's aggregated detention data ranged at 36,000 and Mexico's at over 70,000 in the same year. In the case of Argentina, the, the representative presented 140 and seven residencies granted to African immigrants in 2009, which compares to an overall immigrant population of 1.4 million in Argentina. Why do they care, right? I think in the first instance, this suggests that what governments perceive as the overall flows of, or the overall inflows um, of Africans are way bigger than the official data we have to, to testify or to, to prove these flows. Um, and or that they expect these flows to grow in the very near, fu very near future. Now, it is, it is very difficult to, to estimate the overall size because we're looking at, at mixed flows, which means we're looking at both regular and ir irregular entries of both economic migrants, asylum seekers, potential refugees, and also victims of human smuggling and trafficking. Africans also employ very different access strategies to the region. Um, some overstay tourist visas or enter one country with a valid visa but then travel on to others without the necessary documentation. And there have also been reports of people arriving on container ships. Um, so when, when thinking about how we can, we can estimate what is going on, thus far I thought of, of three official data sets or types of data. And I think that taken together, perhaps they cannot give us accurate total numbers of people arriving, but 
at least give us an idea of, of the trends of what is happening. So these different kinds of data are government data on registered entries and exits, detention data, and asylum data. And I would like to start in the re um, reverse order. I do think that. I'll come to that later. <laughs> this is an American we don't No, I, I, track record, but. I do think. Um, so, but again, um, I think we can come to, to the, re I'll come back to the policy reactions later. I think first of all, or the next section, what I'm trying to do here is, is to, to show what kind of data could one use to actually prove that the people are coming, right? Because maybe just that, the fact that they, the OIS, um, convenes this conference and everyone's concerned. I mean, we, we sort of want to know what kind of flows we're dealing with, right? So the, the, the data that is easiest accessible for the, for the entire region is asylum um, application data. The UNHCR Statistical Online Population Database provides data actually until 2010, but it was just released. So this graph um, only goes to 2009. Um, what both my research now in Ecuador and, and other reports by by governments in the region has shown is that many of the people who make asylum claims are actually economic migrants. And they, and they file asylum claims to at least um, temporarily regularize their, their situation. So my thinking is um, in how far the data on asylum applications could give us an indication not only of the potential refugees coming, but, but of these mixed flows. Um, and the aggregated data from 2003 to 2009 definitely shows an, an upward trend of these asylum applications in the region. Um, furthermore, when we look at where Africans uh, file, file asylum claims, um, we see that this happens in a very, very patterned way, that this doesn't happen across the region, but that we see like a, a huge um, difference in distribution from only two asylum applications from 2000 to 2009 in Paraguay to um, over like 1,500 almost and almost 3,000 in the case of Brazil. Um, a point worth making maybe at this point already is that I think that Brazil, we see a different story in Brazil. I come to that a little bit later, but Brazil historically has received African refugees and it's, it's not really a new phenomena in the region. And um, I'll, I'll talk about Brazil a little bit more later, but so I think Probably in my research, I'll take Brazil out a little bit because I, I think it's a different phenomenon. Um, and this, we see, so we see strong patterns when we think about where people make asylum claims, and we also see a pattern when we when we look at who makes asylum claims where. So again, this is oh sorry. Um, this graph shows Brazil. I'm sorry, sorry, it's it's, it's too small. But basically, the point I was making, making just now, the, this um, red graph shows um, asylum applications from Angola. And um, it basically coincides with, um, how would you say, the demise? Can I say the demise of the civil conflict in, in Angola? And this, oh, you cannot see it at all, but this light green graph shows um, asylum applications from the DRC. And, um, these might be correlated to the conflict in eastern Congo in 2008. Now, in the case of Argentina, we see that they mainly receive asylum applications from Senegal. Um, and in the case of Mexico, there are some from Eritrea and Ethiopia. And in the case of Ecuador, it's Nigeria. I'll come back to this graph a little bit later and, and, and give some initial thoughts on why we see these spikes, right? Um, right now, what I want to show is that we, we, we're seeing an inc a general increase of asylum applications in the region, and we see a strongly patterned way where people from specific countries of origin apply for asylum in specific countries of destination. Um, I now come to the detention data. Um, I guess the most obvious way to, to try to get an idea of what is going on in the field of irregular migration is to have a look at, at detention data. Um, it is not as easy to get this data for the entire region. Some countries, such as Mexico, have the data available online, but in other countries, um, the, the country year data does not even exist, um, or at least is not publicly shared. Um, 
I think that wherever the data does exist, it gives, us, it gives us a clear idea of the trend, not of absolute numbers of what is going on. And here in the case of Mexico, we see that in 2004, there were only 171 detentions of, of African irregular migrants. And then in 2010, we had 1,282. Um, in the case of, of Mexico, it's also interesting that in, in 2010, where we have almost 1,300 um, detentions, there were only 315 visa applications for, for immigrant and non-immigrant um, visas. So I think we can see that, at least in the case of Mexico, irregular flows seem to be far bigger than regular flows. Now again, this doesn't help us in, in calculating total numbers, because we could only t calculate total numbers from this if we knew, knew the ratio of detentions in, in, in Mexico. Now some scholars have tried to estimate right, absolute numbers of irregular migrants in a given country from this, from this detention data, but most, most scholars say it's basically emission impossible. It's, it's very difficult to do that. Um, okay. The last type of data is official immigration data of officially registered uh, regular um, entries and exits. Um, this data is not available very easily either, and in the case of Ecuador, I got this data because I interviewed the right um, high-ranking police official of the migration police who gave the right lady in the statistics department the permission to give me the data, and I had brought a memory stick along. That's basically <laughs> why, why I got this data. Um, to, to understand um, why African entries surged in 2008 and then um, nosedived in 2010, we really have to understand the political context of Ecuador. Um, in June 2008, President Correa introduced a general no visa policy, basically allowing anyone, all world citizens, to, to enter the country for a 90 days tourist stay. Um, in 2010, however, visa requirements were reintroduced for 10 um, nations, including um, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, and Somalia from Africa. Um, the, I don't want to go into the reasons why just now. Um, I'll come to that later. But what I want to talk about is the fact that as soon as there was what I would call a, a political opportunity of entry to the region, um, people started coming. And the question is whether this speaks to, to uh, the numbers are very small, so I wouldn't call it an immigration pressure, but a general tendency of, of Africans wanting to move towards the region. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about is this, is the net migration. So these are the entries from 2008 to 2011. And, and what I want to show with these graphs, although the numbers are small, is that we can assume that the motivations of people coming were that they came not, to, not because of tourism or because of business trips, but they came to stay. And if we look at Eritrea, for example, um, 400 people entered in 2010. And the, the net migration, so the difference of people who entered and left in 2010 uh, also were 400. So basically they came and stayed. What this kind of data doesn't tell us, what, what qualitative research suggests, is that they didn't stay in Ecuador. But they didn't leave through regular channels. They left irregularly to, to move towards Mexico, Central America, Mexico, and the United States. So um, it's, it's, it's difficult, right? Um, we, we have an idea of the main countries of origin and destination, and taken together, asylum applications, detention data, exits and entries, we seem, there, there really seems to be an upward trend. Something seems to be happening. But it's, 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 I'm still struggling. If you have ideas on what other data to use to, to try to prove these flows and show these flows, um, I'd be very excited. Um, I'll come to the next point. Why is it that Africans start moving towards Latin America? Um, I believe that essentially economic motivations of Africans to leave their home countries can be treated as a given. International migrants generally move to improve their living conditions and to seize better opportunities abroad. Now sometimes these opportunities may be of a purely financial kind, but I think very often um, they also relate to political and social factors. But I think taken together, you can, I consider all of these factors as, as an economic motivation of improving my situation. I think the crucial question um, we have to ask to understand why Africans are moving to Latin America is not why they leave Africa, but which factors determine where they go. 
Given the geographic concentration of African immigrants outside of Africa and Europe, the academic literature focuses on African flows towards European Union member states. Existing studies describe the advantages with relation to transfer costs and the established cultural and socioeconomic links of African diasporas to their former colonial um, mother countries as the main reasons for the concentration of African migration to Europe. What then explains the expansion of African migration to Latin America? It's a region that is further away, it's more expensive to reach, it certainly has, with the exception of Brazil maybe, but no real colonial ties to Africa, and perhaps most importantly, it offers reduced opportunities of income maximization. And I think here, politics and immigration policy comes in. Because if we lived in a world without borders, all African migrants would most likely move to where they felt they could best improve their living conditions. However, in the real world, governments do try to control migration. In the, I don't know who of you is familiar with the, with the migration literature, but um, the, the ability of states to manage migration is widely contested in the literature. Um, some scholars rate the existence of irregular migration, which are movements that violate the immigration laws of countries and basically happen against the will of the respective governments as proof of the ineffective, ineffectiveness of immigration policies. And I think here, conceptually, we have to, we have to, we have to make um, a separation between the, the concept of effectiveness and effect or impact. I th effectiveness always relates to the clearly stated policy goal, right? Um, and I think in the field of, of migration, it's very hard to measure because as many of us know, um, it's, it's the, the, there's very often a huge gap between the discourse and, and the real policy goals behind immigration policy. But I think what we can look at is the policy effect or policy impact on migration. So basically the repercussion on policy on the flows independent of what the original policy goals were. That makes sense. Um, and I think we can say that, that, that to 